Hi everybody, welcome to Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Echo in the Canyon. It's an awesome movie. You guys are gonna love it. Jacob Dylan, Andy Slater. What's up, guys? Good to meet you. How are you doing, man? Good How are you? Meet you? Thanks for coming in. Of course. So I just watched the film, and I was just telling you guys off camera. It took me into a whole different place, whole different world musically. I'd never been exposed to. So first of all, congrats on the film. Thank you. Thank really you. Really enjoyed it. So Jake, let's start with you. I mean, you're all over the world talking to people. Mm -hmm. What was it like putting this thing together? Um, well, it's quite a ride. We just kind of dove in. We just kind of started with Eric Clapton and thought that was a good place to for my first interview. Might as well start right at the top. Good guy to right? start with, right? Yeah. How about you, Andy? What was the coolest thing for you with this? Well, the coolest thing was to actually be able to make a film, mm. to have an idea of something and then to record music and to you know go to the people and talk to them about the songs that they wrote and then put it together. I mean, that period of music is so fertile, you know, and what happened in Laurel Canyon in 1965 with the trading of those ideas creatively between, between the Birds and the, and, and the Beatles and the Beach Boys and, and the Beatles, it, 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 was, uh, it was an amazing time. So to be able to talk to the people that wrote the songs was just, just incredible. Yeah, it was really magical. And so for people that haven't been to Laurel Canyon, how would you guys describe it? What was going on there? And just the fact that all of these groups were there, I mean, that, that's crazy when you think about it. So how would you describe it? Uh, well, I mean, I think it actually looks and feels quite a bit the same. But um, I think David Crosby suggested he's the first one to go there. And um, if you, you haven't been there, we were. I haven't been there. No. haven't been there. Well, you know, it's right there in the middle. It's, like, it, it's this, you know, it's a wilderness right in the middle of Los Angeles. You're five minutes from being down the hill, from being at the Roxy and all those places, but you are in the wilderness. Uh, and they could walk on foot and they could see each other and mm. play this music. And it's still, that's still, I mean, I guess it, there's some similarities, but everybody now has a computer in their home, so right. they don't have to go walk and do anything as much. Um, but why, why Laurel Canyon? I mean, do you, well, Michelle says in the film that it was always a place for bohemians and actors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing about uh, Los Angeles is that you're always on the edge of nature. You know, and in Laurel Canyon, the way it's situated and the way the houses are, at that time you could have a great sense of community. You have to remember in 1965 and 66, it's really before big business comes into the music business and people, I think their, you know, egos are... It's, it's not quite as inflated from years and years of, of pop music uh, stardom and the evolution of that. So as far as Laurel Canyon goes, you know, it's happening in Los Angeles in all places now. Uh, but that time was a time of community and kindness and sharing. And I think for us, the film is as much about the echo as it is about the canyon. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about the reverberation of people's creativity and their ideas inside those bands because each of those bands had multiple singers and multiple songwriters so they were trading ideas and then between those groups in their community in Laurel Canyon and then ultimately across to England where you know it changes the course of the Beatles. Yeah I mean those stories with the birds and the Beatles and then you throw the Beach Boys in there I, I never realized just how much crossover there was between those groups. Well it, you know in the film you find out that Roger McGuinn sees A Hard Day's Night mm -hmm. and he gets a 12 string Rickenbacker, and he writes, no, he, he, he records Bells of Rimney, so he electrifies folk music, and the Beatles hear that, George Harrison hears Bells of Rimney, and he writes If I Needed Someone, which goes on Rubber Soul, and Brian Wilson hears Rubber Soul, and he writes Pet Sounds, and the Beatles hear Pet Sounds, and they write Sgt. Pepper, and to me that was, you know, it was always something we knew as, mus you know, musicians and record makers, but to be able to flesh it out in a way where we could talk to people, record the songs, record new versions of the songs, interpret them as duets was, uh, was, was, was great. Definitely. So you're hanging out with Tom Petty, and he's, he's like a fan. He's, he's giddy over talking about these groups. So mm -hmm. whether it was him or some of these other people, how did you get them to open up and really just bring all this out to the surface? Well, first of all, it was not investigative reporting. Right. Nobody was promoting a <laughs> record. No one was promoting anything. Yeah. They were just kind enough to come down. We just, you know, we're hopefully setting up a situation for them to be comfortable. And it was more of a, it was a conversation, you know, and I'm, I've done that plenty with other artists my age and older. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think there was any pressure for them. I don't think they, were, they felt like they were promoting anything or it was just totally casual. And most importantly, I mean, as, as the filming went on, there were holes to fill once the narrative started to develop, but very, particularly up, up till the very end last few interviews, it was really just about them t talking about whatever they wanted to remember, 
you know, about a long time ago. Some, yeah. some things I don't want to remember. Uh, but some of the, what you might call the more uh, provocative things were not, that wasn't provoked by me. This is things people wanted to talk about. Right. You know? And I think that's one of the great things you get from the film, which is that you're almost eavesdropping on a personal conversation between two friends Absolutely. from two different generations yeah. and from one writer to another. And I think that enables us, enabled us to capture uh, stuff that maybe a journalist would, sitting across from one another artist, maybe would not have been able to extract. Hmm. I love the new spin that you put on the old tunes, too. So it's oh. like you're playing Brian Wilson's old tunes and he's sitting right there. So was yeah. there a pressure that you felt with those greats in there? Why would there be any pressure playing <laughs> Brian Wilson his own song 50 years later? Yeah, there's, there's well, I, I mean, I'm, if I had to find a word for it, I'm not sure what that word would be. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's, um wasn't pressure, but um, it's daunting. Mm -hmm. I mean, without question, sure. I mean, you've had some amazing musical experiences. That Those must have been up there in terms of the company that you held there and just how you were able to bring that back to light all these years later. Yeah, uh, you know, I've, I've played in front of some of those people before. I don't know if I've actually been this close to them had a, and played them their own song, mm -hmm. you know, but... Um, it's a little different, right? A little bit, but they were all very generous, all very cool. Yeah. I think one of the things we were trying to do is to make something a little different in the, in the documentary. You know, we obviously interviewed all those people and we could have taken their interviews and sort of put them over footage, and that was a very effective way to tell a story. For us, we were trying to give you the feeling of being in a room when a song was being recorded and then in the middle of the song take you to a concert when it was being played, performed, and then back to the studio and then have the reaction of the person that wrote it or performed it there and that's what happens with Michelle Phillips yeah. and it happens uh, a, a little bit I think with, uh, with Expecting to Fly with Regina Spector mm -hmm. so you know it, we, we made it for to experience I think more in the theater because when you go from those environments mm -hmm. the sound of the size of the room changes and it's not that easy to in the middle of a song go to the live performance right. but you know technology is your friend in that regard you know maybe not in the sense of community but definitely in that regard it was no it was cool how you guys cut back and forth with that yeah and, um, you know even talking about Brian Wilson you know it's very easy to put the Beach Boys in a box and think about the guys wearing all the same shirts and everything but Petty really gets to it, like he, he was a musical genius. So what was it like learning some of these new things or maybe stuff that had just kind of been buried underneath the surface about guys like Wilson? Uh, well, that's actually interesting. When people think of the Beach Boys, I guess some people do think of the surfboards and the matching shirts. Um, I could see if you were someone like Tom Petty or Jack Severn, you grew up with that music, you might remember, you might remember those images as strongly as the next ones, mm -hmm. but I never think of those, of those images really. I, I think of the later Beach Boys stuff, uh, the image anyway. Um, but um, what was the original question you asked? Just Sorry. learning more about these guys beyond just what people may think about them. So there are some people that just see Beach Boys, same shirts, surfboards. There's well, but, a new group but, that's going to learn, like me, that Wilson's a musical genius. Oh, yeah, okay, Brian, yeah. Well, it depends on what you're listening to. You know, if you're listening to the earlier period where, where Brian's father's producing, mm -hmm. and you know, they're more influenced by the surf culture and, and those kind of bands and, and, and the harmony groups like the barbershop quartet and the vocal groups, that's one thing. But Brian starts to really expand, you know, the parameters of what the Beach Boys are doing by both, you know, thematically, sonically, and, you know, he's searching for the self and the idea of, you know, how one fits into society. And I think, you know, I just wasn't made for these times, you know, his his singing of that, it it exemplifies maybe his own struggle. And at the same time, as Jacob and I have talked about, you know, the Beatles had George Martin. So when they wanted to expand what they were doing beside, beyond a four-piece, they had George Martin to, to orchestrate. Brian just had Brian, mm. and he's in that room with those guys, the Wrecking Crew. And all those ideas are in his head. So the, the, the immensity of his genius is, can't be, you know, um, you know, can't be measured in, in, in today's terms. No doubt. So there's a lot that goes into making a film in terms of time, money, resources. You guys lived it. So what were some of the biggest challenges you faced along the way? Well, there's, uh, there's a lot of challenges, especially for first-time filmmakers. Mm -hmm. New challenges are constantly arriving. Uh, very time-consuming, of course. But, you know, and then, you know, these are all... These are all people who are 
the very desirable people to speak to. You know, these are we didn't we didn't pick any slouches. So <laughs> it was very time consuming and, and a lot of just, you know, a lot of waiting to get to them and find their time. You set out to make a film, you have an idea for a story as a document documentary filmmaker. And I would imagine as I've talked to other filmmakers that you chase the story and often the story that you're chasing is not what you wind up with. For us, we, were, we started with the idea of people in New York uh, migrating to California and the electrification of folk music. I think, you know, in New York, the, the folk scene was so rigid, I don't know that it, it would have been electrified like it was with, with the birds in California. And uh, what, we, what we found after start talking to people was that the story really was in California yeah. when everybody got there right. and the sense of community. So I think one of the challenges is that each one of those bands is a documentary in itself. Absolutely. Each one of those guys in those bands <laughs> is a documentary. So to try to tell a story about Laurel Canyon, the echo of people's ideas, that particular time, and then sort of echo that work in some contemporary artist work and, and, and show that was a lot to weave together. And, you know, it's challenging, but it's incredibly rewarding. And, and it takes, like, everything we've learned mm. in, in 20 years of record making and storytelling, so. Yeah, you guys packed a lot in there. Yeah. You know, the time yeah. that you had, yeah. I give you a lot of credit. So from all the different travels that you guys had, California, London, New York, what were some of your favorite stories that you learned along the way, just favorite experiences of shooting? Hmm. Where do you start with that? How about Crosby? You were saying there was a fun well, story. Well, it was a funny story with David in that we were trying to find, I mean, I mean, one of the things about documentaries that I have seen, and the documentaries about Laurel Canyon, while they go after the story, they look terrible, you know, yeah. there was like a plant behind a guy's head and one light and it was just like shot from a weird angle. Uh, we, well, I want to, you know, I revere these songwriters mm -hmm. and these guys, I wanted them to look good because I wanted people to want to look at them because what, what I was trying to do was have it be personal so you could stay on the guy's face and you could see him tell you from inside the human thing. Right. Uh, with David, with just a funny thing happened. We were trying to find something that would, you know, represent California and the expansiveness of the canyon. So I was looking for the perfect place to shoot him as the guy who grew up in Santa Barbara and was the, you know, and, and John Sebastian sort of represents New York, and we shot him at the Albert Hotel. So we were driving down this neighborhood, and somebody said, looking for a location, and somebody said, hey, that, that looks like a great house. And we went down there and it looked great. We knock on the door, and no one's there. So I wow. said to the producer, you know, we really should shoot here. He said, yeah, well, we can't shoot here unless the people, you know, let us. I said, okay, so, so what do we do? He said, I'm gonna send a production assistant up to here and mm -hmm. then they'll wait around till the people get home and then we'll get them to sign a release. So at the end of the day, the guy calls and says, they're not here. So I said, well, just have them go knock on other people's doors and see like where these what people are. Is, yeah. So we found out that the people in that house were away for three weeks. Mm -hmm. And so the guy said, the producer said, you can't shoot here. And I said, what are you talking about? It's an independent film. Where's your independent spirit? Come on, <laughs> let's style, shoot here. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So we'll go up there. He said, Andy, we have a rock star coming. You know, we could get arrested. So we're not going to get arrested. So let's just go up there. <laughs> so he said, okay. So of course I have a 12 by 12 and three cameras mm -hmm. and all this crazy stuff. And David Crosby gets there. And we're all, you know, setting up and on these people's lawn that are not home. <laughs> and he says, let's go in the house. And I said, well, Dave, we can't go in the house. And he said, what do you mean we can't go in the house? <laughs> I said, well, you know, not, hey, let's go to the trailer. I go, David, there, there's no trailer. He goes, there's no trailer. He says, you know what, next time you call, remind me to, to not take your call. Oh, anyway, goodness. we got in there, we shot the thing, we, you know, we shot in like 40 minutes and we got out there and wow. luckily, hopefully this interview won't bust us and we won't get sued. And if That's we do, it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> How about going to London, hanging with Ringo? I mean, it's just you and him? Right his car. No, that's, Where uh, was that? no, that's actually, that's Los Angeles. Oh, that's Los Angeles? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, that's uh, that's Andrew's car. Oh, it's your car. Yeah, it's not a stock nice. car. It's not a Hollywood car. It's his actual day-to-day -day driver. We spent a lot of time in that car. Yeah, it, back cruising in, around. It, well, you know, in the early days of uh, trying to figure out the wallflowers. Yeah, let's say we we're, were driving it long ago when it was called a used car, yeah. not a vintage <laughs> muscle car. Yeah. What about the car that you're driving around? For that's it. Same yeah. car. Same car. Yeah, same oh, yeah. car. Nice. That's it. Yeah. I like those those shots as well. Yeah, they're cool, huh? You're showing showing the scene there, and it's just like very introspective shots. Yeah. You kind of thinking everything through. So I'm thinking it through. 
I mean, it must have blown your mind with some of these things. There's so much to think about, especially as a musician, too, still doing your thing, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm driving a car down the streets of Los Angeles with cameras everywhere. I'm trying to, like, people yelling at me. I'm trying to pretend it's, this is yeah, it's, I'm just, it's, just not But, you know, it, the film Model Shop, which was the inspiration mm -hmm. for right. this film, or at least the beginning of the inspiration for it, sent us back there. The guy in that film has a green MGB, and he's driving around sort of searching for himself, and he meets this girl, and he's, you know, he's on his own sort of quest, searching for the muse, let's just say. Mm -hmm. So some of the stuff that we were doing, we saw our lives in Los Angeles as a parallel at that point to that character. I think we had been I was in a period of transition, and so was Jacob. We had gone. Jacob had made a bunch of records, a touring cycle. I was at Capitol, and we left. And we were, we were trying to figure out, you know, what was the next thing to do. So, all of it just is a metaphor for, you know, where we were at at that time. Yeah, definitely. You guys have been friends for a long time too. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so you've seen the many different chapters of your life. I'm, I'm sure when you first met, you maybe couldn't have imagined making a film like this all these years later. Well, the first man I would have needed a chaperone to get on the airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we were driving around in my Firebird, and we were going to places where I don't think he was old enough to get in. I was not. Yeah, <laughs> I was not. I mean, did you sneak him yeah. in? Yeah. Well, I did sneak him in, and uh, and it and it all worked out. It's a good friend right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. when people check out the film this weekend, what's one big takeaway you want from them to have? Uh, well, you know, I think I think you could. Like I said before, we definitely just let these people talk about what they wanted to talk about Lowell Kane. And there's, there's a whole other, lots of other stories that someone could tell you about Lowell Kane. There's a lot of other movies within Lowell Kane within the same time. But this is their version of it. This is how they want to be remembered. This is what they wanted to share. And it's all mostly a real positive story. I'm sure if you dig in, you could find there's other stuff that was going on that maybe wasn't so positive. But this is a really pleasant look at a time that hopefully can be remembered mostly fondly. You know, I think it's a time of community and kindness. You know, like, like Jacob said, we didn't focus on the social implications, the upheaval, the political stuff, mm -hmm. the Vietnam War. Right. Even though that stuff was starting to happen, we just wanted the songs and the songwriting and the sense of partnership that's there. So if people, if people come in and see that movie and they're inspired by the music or they're inspired by the sentiment of what's happening then, then maybe they can take that sense of community and a little bit of that kindness out of the theater Lowell into their King own roles. full, though. Don't come rushing out and try to find a place. <laughs> Too expensive, not enough room. No, you don't want any more people. I mean, like L.A. in general, we're, we're full. Yeah, I think there's too many people. There's yeah. enough traffic, right? We're good. Yeah, I mean, good. yeah. Yeah, everybody's fine everywhere. There's nowhere for anybody to go. Yeah, it's true. Even New York. Nowhere, nowhere to go. Yeah. A lot of space. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, it's been awesome. Hey, right on, so man. Thank Jacob, you, buddy. Thanks a lot. Okay. Hey, you too. Okay. All right, everybody. See you next time. Right, let's see you.